This video was sponsored by Enlisted. Check it out via the link in the description. The world of the 1930s was one dominated by liberalism. Aside from Germany and Italy, every major Western power was some kind of liberal democracy. The conservatives were liberal, the socialists were liberal, the liberals were liberal. And what was the West's reward for its universal liberalism? The Global Depression of the 1930s. In the United States, many Americans didn't know what to make of this. It just didn't feel like the country they grew up in anymore, and it certainly wasn't the country their founders promised them. But was it ever? Could their memories of childhood politics be a lie? Did their founding fathers really turn out to be frauds? But there existed no political theory or ideology that explained what they felt, so each of these Americans thought that they were isolated and alone. They just assumed that this is the way the world was, the way it's been before, and the way it always is going to be. But then, in the 1940s, a series of events transpired which caused these lovers of liberty to realize that they weren't alone, that they were, in fact, a movement. A movement that would soon call itself libertarianism. So you can call me Ezekiel, and this is the history of American libertarianism. But before we talk about the ideology of capitalism, let's participate in it, because this video was sponsored by Enlisted, the new first-person shooter from Dark Flow Studios. Enlisted puts you in charge of your own squad of AI soldiers in massive PvP battles against other players leading their own squads. With so many players and AI troops, battles in Enlisted can be massive, with hundreds of soldiers. The game takes place in the most iconic campaigns of World War II, from Moscow to Berlin, and from North Africa to the Pacific. Each one features its own highly detailed army formations and historically accurate equipment, which, of course, includes tanks and airplanes. Mixing PvP and PvE, Enlisted has something for everyone, from casuals to the most hardcore players. The game is available right now on PC, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 5, and the previous console generation. So make sure you use our link in the description and pinned comment to get an exclusive free bonus pack, including multiple weapons, soldiers, and a premium account. And now, back to the video. English barrister John Lind commented that Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence was, functionally, an anarchist document. Every government on Earth violated at least one of its inalienable rights. Even a government headed by Jefferson himself couldn't resist the temptation. The Louisiana Purchase was such an amazing deal that Jefferson both violated the Constitution and took on national debt which he hated to make it happen. If even Thomas Jefferson couldn't uphold the principles of limited government and natural rights, who could? Other early influences on what would soon be libertarian thought were anarchists, men like Pradhan, Benjamin Tucker, and Josiah Warren. But the most influential of this cohort was Lysander Spooner. Even during the American Civil War, when Spooner was writing, the United States was a very different country from what the founders had envisioned. To Spooner, that meant worse. Conservatives of both Spooner's time and our own constantly bemoan how many political problems would be solved if the government just followed its constitution. But Spooner famously shot back. The constitution has either authorized such a government as we have had, or has been powerless to prevent it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. It is through Spooner that much of libertarianism's anti-liberalism originates. And finally, libertarianism would be a very different ideology today if it weren't for the influence of Austrian economics. In 1840, Karl Menger published the founding work of the Austrian School of Economics, Principles of Economics. Austrian economics is a massive topic on its own, so luckily, we already have a video covering it and the school's interpretation of the Great Depression. You can check it out by clicking the link on the top right of your screen. The school had very few adherents in its early years. Its ideas only survived by being passed down from one small generation of scholars to the next. But that changed when it fell into the hands of its third generation, Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich von Hayek. A statue of Professor Mises ought to occupy an honorable place in the hall of the Central Planning Board of the Socialist State, to thank him for his service in showing us the problems that we socialists must and will solve to centrally plan our economy without the use of property or money prices. Socialist economist Oscar Lang. 
Ludwig von Mises was born in Lvov, today a city in western Ukraine, but at the time a part of the Austrian Empire. He was converted to Austrian economics after reading Menger's Principles of Economics. But ironically, our great advocate of free markets spent his early career working for Austria-Hungary's Internal Revenue Service before serving as an artillery captain in the First World War. Mises' post-war years were spent trying to convince the Austrian government not to print its way out of debt, but the rise of Nazism convinced Mises, partially a Jew himself, to leave for Switzerland, and later the United States. In America, Mises met Henry Hazlitt, who would become one of the greatest popularizers of his ideas in the best-selling Economics in One Lesson. But Mises' magnum opus was Human Action, a complete top-to-bottom treatise on Austrian economics. But for various reasons, his ideas never became popular within American academia. One of those reasons was Mises' personality. Quote, Milton Friedman delights in telling a story of Mises cutting off relationships for years with his old friend Fritz Matchlop over a disagreement about the gold standard, and angrily condemning a gaggle of his fellow Mon Pelerin free market mandarins as, quote, a bunch of socialists. Brian Doherty, Radicals for Capitalism. But Human Action was only published in 1949, so fellow Austrian, both by birth and economic school, Hayek beat Mises to the punch. Friedrich von Hayek was also born in Austria, also served in the Austrian Empire's artillery during the war, and also worked for the Austrian government after the war in a position directly under Mises. After trying and failing to break into the American economic scene, Hayek found himself in London, where he started his great rivalry with John Maynard Keynes. While things started great for Hayek, it eventually ended in a Keynesian victory. As the self-described penultimate Hayekian put it, in the early 1930s, everyone was a Hayekian. At the end of the decade, there were only two of us. This was largely the result of Hayek getting bored with the rivalry and no longer challenging Keynes's ideas, allowing them to take over the world without resistance. Hayek's most famous work is The Road to Serfdom. It proved to be a far more popular work than Human Action, although less academically influential. This is probably because it's far less radical than Human Action. It even ended with a call for a single global world government. So it's no surprise that the work is just as popular in conservative circles as it is in libertarian ones. As important as the Austrians are, stuffy old men debating economics only influence the libertarian movement. The honor of its creation goes to three revolutionary women. In 1943, Ayn Rand, Isabel Patterson, and Rose Wilder Lane published their seminal works, The Fountainhead, Discovery of Freedom, and The God of the Machine. These three women all knew each other, and even disagreed on many issues. Rand was an atheist, while her two colleagues were believers. Lane was even an Islamophile, and really liked Albania for some reason. But they all agreed on one key issue, freedom. Specifically, that the United States government was at war with it. They hated the American government's taxes, its regulations, its prohibitions, and its concentration camps. Their books told the world why. Rose Wilder Lane was the most empirical of the three. She was a globe-traveling journalist and possible ghostwriter of Little House on the Prairie. In her discovery of freedom, she recounts the absurdities and atrocities created by governments around the world and the incredible wealth she only found in free societies. Patterson was a more abstract political theorist, equating a society's free creative energy to electricity in a circuit, and government to a thief siphoning away the power to its own nefarious ends. Rand was the most ambitious of the three. She didn't just set out to write a political treatise, but to present a whole philosophy in novel form, one that culminated in a political system of laissez-faire capitalism. In Rand's philosophy, human freedom, reason, creative vision, and happiness were its core values. In the depressed and war-ravaged world of 1943, these ideas spread like wildfire. Across the country, men and women who had thought themselves alone suddenly discovered that they were not alone, that they were, in fact, a movement. So it was time to get building. The first major libertarian organization was the Foundation for Economic Education, or FEE, founded by Leonard Reed. Reed was transformed into a radical anti-New Dealer after first-hand experience with it in the Chamber of Commerce. He then became vice president of the National Industrial Conference Board. It was a pro-business, pro-market lobbying group. 
But to the NBIC, business took priority over market. Reed thought it should be the other way around. But, and perhaps even worse, the NBIC had a policy of presenting every side of each issue. This outraged Reed. As his biographer put it, the other side was everywhere. Even businessmen had come to rely on government. How do you represent both sides when one side is all around you? Soon, Reed got in touch with Rand, Lane, and pro-market members of the business community, and convinced them to help him start the fee. These connections allowed it to grow rapidly, but not everyone was happy with the fee. Rand was initially highly supportive, but became disillusioned with its economical and utilitarian approach. Rand was not just a political theorist, but a philosopher of metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics too. She believed that capitalism's utility was unimportant compared to its moral basis. She was especially annoyed by a fee pamphlet that claimed that there was no moral difference between free markets and government price controls, and that the only reason why the price controls were wrong was entirely due to their inefficiency. If the fee was merely offensive, then to the highly atheistic Rand, the other major libertarian organization of the time would be seen as downright evil. In 1943, the General Council of the Congregational and Christian Churches called for an end to America's free enterprise system. This was a move on behalf of the still-dominant social gospel movement, which is basically just social justice but with Jesus. This incensed one James William Feifel Jr. He was getting sick of the council's commie bullshit, and decided to finally do something about it. He formed an explicitly Christian free market education group, Mobilization for Spiritual Ideals, better known by its shorthand, Spiritual Mobilization. James Feifeld was the right man for the job too, since he was well connected to Leonard Reed's fee through members of his congregation. Spiritual mobilization was massive for the early libertarian movement. They had their own magazine, Faith and Freedom, a nationally syndicated radio program called The Freedom Story, and many of its members preached their Christian capitalism directly from the pulpit. But spiritual mobilization wasn't a last. Feifeld retired in 1954, and was replaced by James Ingebretson, who had once commented that religion was balderdash. And, I didn't come to spiritual mobilization as a minister. I came as a lawyer and a libertarian. Fighting the forces that wanted to abolish the free enterprise system was my mission, not promoting Christ. Naturally, his atheism soon gave way to religious epiphany and hallucinogenic drug abuse. Much of this was due to the influence of the Eastern-style mystic Gerald Hurd. Spiritual mobilization's leadership became utterly enamored by Hurdism, devoting more and more resources into Hurd's antics. All of this disgusted the organization's Christian support base, who abandoned it in droves. As a result, by the 1960s, spiritual mobilization ceased to be an effective part of the libertarian movement. While spiritual mobilization shot up and fell down, Ayn Rand's movement would prove to be far more sustainable. She called it objectivism. Out of the three founding mothers of libertarianism, only Rand would enjoy massive and long-term success. The Fountainhead was a word-of-mouth hit that continues to sell millions of copies to this day. One new fan of hers was the Canadian Nathaniel Blumenthal. After a correspondence, Rand invited him to visit her San Fernando home where they became friends. Eventually, they both moved to New York City, and Nathaniel changed his last name to Brandon. They worked closely together to turn the philosophy initially presented in the Fountainhead into a complete system. Mises and Hazlitt were also in New York at the time. Rand and Mises even became fond of one another, with Mises at one point calling her the most courageous man in America. This prompted Rand to ask for clarification. Did he say man? When answered in the affirmative, Rand's masculine heart was absolutely elated. Ayn Rand soon developed a close circle of followers, including many relatives of Brandon and his wife. This group of radical individualists chose to take on the ironical name, The Collective. In September of 1955, Rand and Brandon announced to both of their spouses that they wanted to begin an affair. While both partners assented, this infidelity would have negative consequences down the line, but not before Rand published her magnum opus in 1957, Atlas Shrugged. Atlas Shrugged would go on to sell millions more copies than even The Fountainhead. 
Taking advantage of this, Rand and Brandon founded the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, or NBI, with the mission of spreading their objectivist philosophy around the nation. Rand only reluctantly agreed to this, believing that it would be a failure, but the NBI's lecture series was a massive hit, producing thousands of professionally trained objectivists each year. By the 1960s, the movement had its own official newsletter and magazine. Unfortunately, in Rand's inner circle, things weren't so great. Rand was always an introvert, persnickety, and humorless. Fine traits in a philosopher, but bad in a leader. Usually, when Rand disagreed with someone, she would get frustrated and disassociate with them. But Brandon was a loyalist, and very extroverted. He was the one pushing to form the NBI and organize the movement, so he was responsible for creating a conveyor belt of impressionable followers to Rand, and when one strayed from Rand's good graces, his loyalism caused him to drop the hammer on them and force them back into line. Alone, neither Rand nor Brandon would have been a problem, but together, they were a nightmare. Uh, the term cult gets thrown around at this point. While the Collective, whose name wasn't nearly as ironic now, wasn't quite that bad, it certainly wasn't a positive environment either. It wasn't uncommon for people to get disillusioned with their former idol Ayn Rand, which brings us to our next subject, a man who would join the Collective and become disillusioned with Ayn Rand firsthand, Murray Rothbard. <laughs> When Ludwig von Mises wrote Human Action, he wrote it, in part, as a love letter to liberalism. Much of the work is apologetics for liberalism, and polemics against its enemies. However, in writing his work in the name of liberalism, Mises would unleash something very, very illiberal. In 1926, Murray Newton Rothbard was born in the Bronx to a Polish-Jewish immigrant family. It's very strange that the founder of anarcho-capitalism would come from such a family, since nearly all of them were communists. Only his father was of the political right. Rothbard's early school years were spent as a Republican in the dying days of the Old Right, but he soon discovered Austrian economics, which prompted him to attend Mises' lectures at New York University and to do work for Leonard Reed's fee. Always a rebel and an iconoclast, Rothbard delighted in advertising to left-wing college students that he was a New York Jew for Strom Thurmond. All in the name of states' rights, of course. Rothbard's libertarianism became even more radical from there, until eventually, he was asked in a debate why, if a community could justify having a small state, what principle would stop them from agreeing to a larger state? Rothbard found this argument convincing, so decided that the only way to be a true libertarian was to oppose the state entirely. Murray Rothbard, the anarcho-capitalist, was born. Rothbard's early writings were for spiritual mobilization's Faith and Freedom, and William F. Buckley's National Review. But the readership of Faith and Freedom were shocked by Rothbard's anti-war stances, making them think that he was a leftist. Rothbard clashed directly with Buckley for similar reasons. Buckley would prove to be a long-running and very petty enemy of Rothbard's. In addition to his own circle of friends he called the Circle Bastiat, Rothbard was a member of Ayn Rand's collective, but he was disappointed that she didn't follow her freedom philosophy through to its anarchist conclusion, and instead stopped short at minarchism. But Rothbard's real issue with Rand wasn't ideological, but personal. Rand's serious and humorless personality clashed with Rothbard's humorous and self-aware worldview. The last straw came when Rand tried convincing Rothbard's wife, Joey, a practicing Christian, to become an atheist. When Rand finished making her argument, Joey politely said that she needed to think about it. This prompted Rand to castigate Rothbard for being so irrational as to be married to a believer. That was it. Rothbard was sick of these people, and he left Rand's circle for good. While he definitely didn't do it, I like to think that on the way out, Rothbard told the collective, Screw you guys, I have my own political philosophy! With hookers and blackjack! This personal dispute would have major consequences for Rothbard, Ayn Rand, and the libertarian movement at large. Many believed that this personal dispute is why Rand refused to identify with the libertarian movement, even though her objectivism so clearly fit underneath its umbrella. Luckily, Rand's influence on Rothbard would be much more positive. It was Rand who introduced him to the realm of ethical philosophy, which was a major influence on his anarcho-capitalist philosophy. 
Rothbard's anarcho-capitalism was deontological, which means that like Rand, he supported it primarily because it's the most moral system, regardless of its effectiveness. But that doesn't mean he discounted practical concerns. Rothbard was an accomplished Austrian economist as well, and took the school places that even the already radical Mises wouldn't go, by applying its free market philosophy to the realms of law enforcement, justice, and national defense. And with that, the last major libertarian ideology has formed. Will the libertarian movement continue to attract followers around the country? How will they interact with the far more dominant conservative movement, or their counterparts on the libertarian left? And will Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon's infidelity come back to haunt them? Of course it will! Find out all of this and more in part 2. Which, when it's out, you'll be able to watch by clicking the link on the top right of your screen. This video was funded by a secret cabal of corporate interests in their quest to create a tax-free libertarian utopia, including Josiah, and by this video's sponsor, Enlisted. Make sure you sign up using our link in the description and pinned comment. It'll get you an exclusive free bonus pack, including weapons, soldiers, and a premium account. Like, comment, and subscribe for more. I'll see you in part two. Keep your rifle by your side. Sing it. Oh Lord, this earth was made for us singing. Oh Lord, this thing.